Hi folks, welcome back to the bench where today we are a little bit more zoomed in than normal because we're going to be taking a close look at these two revolvers and the different philosophies of how they operate safely. On the left, we have a Colt Python. This is the 2020 re-release with this particular revolver being made in 2021. On the right here, we have a Smith & Wesson Model 66. This particular revolver was made in 1987 and differs a little bit from newer production in a few ways. Uh, you may also know this revolver as the Model 19 if it is in a blued or nickel finish or as the Combat Magnum. It's a pretty typical K-frame, six-shot, 357 Magnum Smith & Wesson revolver from that time period. Uh, very similar revolvers in many ways. Um, obviously, they're both stainless steel. They both have four-inch barrels. They're both 357 Magnum. They both hold six shots in their cylinder and both have a double action, single action mechanism. So on a surface level, they're practically the same gun. I mean, you'd probably use them for very similar tasks, but the way the designs approach the safety concerns is a little bit different. And in fact, it's kind of opposite. What you have on the Smith & Wesson is what is called a hammer block. And the way it's working is that it is blocking the hammer. So it is using this object here, which I can just take off and show you. It's using this object here, particularly this portion of it, to sit up here in the way of the hammer coming forward until the trigger is pulled and this is then retracted downward as the trigger pushes back on the rebound slide here. This little stud cams against this surface and causes the hammer block to be pulled downward. The reason I'm able to do it right now is because I don't have the side plate installed and so the little track that it normally rides in here isn't restraining it. The Colt has kind of an opposite mechanism where when you pull the trigger on the Colt, it is moving a transfer bar up into place to be struck by the hammer to then transfer the energy to the firing pin that is mounted within the frame. Uh, one interesting note on, on this is that a transfer bar mechanism has to have a frame mounted firing pin. You cannot have the firing pin on the hammer when you're using a transfer bar mechanism. The firing pin block mechanism, as on the Smith & Wesson here, can either work just fine with a firing pin fixed to the hammer, as is the case of this 1987 model, or if on a newer gun you have the firing pin mounted in the frame with the smooth-faced hammer, this will still work. You can still block the hammer just the same. So kind of an interesting point there uh, that this is not dependent on firing pin configuration. The Colt's mechanism, the transfer bar mechanism is dependent on firing pin configuration. Another interesting difference is that if your hammer block were to become damaged in some way, let's say it broke, the revolver uh, will still fire. Whereas if your transfer bar breaks, the revolver does not fire. So in that instance, it kind of depends on what you see as the bigger risk. Is the revolver accidentally firing a bigger risk or is the revolver accidentally not firing a bigger risk? You know, if you were using the pistol, using the revolver for bear defense or something, if you've got this out in the back country and you absolutely want to make sure that it will fire, then the hammer block mechanism offers an advantage in that, in that even if the system fails, the gun will still fire, even though you have at that point a damaged safety mechanism. Whereas 
the Colts mechanism, the transfer bar mechanism, tends more towards uh, failing safe, failing in a non-functioning condition, whereas the Smith & Wesson fails in a functioning condition. So it's neither good nor bad, really. It just depends on what you consider the priority to be. Uh, both, both mechanisms work. Both mechanisms are reliable. But it's just a, a different approach, whereas on the cold, you are introducing an object to complete a chain, complete a series of events, complete a, an energy transfer. On the Smith & Wesson, you're using a block to prevent a movement from happening. They both do the same thing, but they approach it in a different way. Let's take a look at the Smith & Wesson first. I'm going to set the Colt off to the side just a little bit here. Let's get the Smith & Wesson kind of front and center. Take a look at it. Before we get too far into it, I think I should make a note that you probably don't want to be doing what I'm about to do uh, on your own unless you take precautions. In this case, I have almost completely detensioned the mainspring. So you have very, very little tension on this. I've backed the screw out. For the rebound slide here, I have replaced the spring in it with the spring out of a pin. Move this uh, light a little bit. I have re replaced the spring in it with a spring out of a pin because what you don't want to do on these revolvers is start manipulating these components under full spring pressure with the side plate off. Because the side plate has these little holes in it that correspond to these studs that are mounted in the frame. And they offer support to those studs. In the case of this firing pin block, it also is offering a guide for the firing pin block to move in so that it cams correctly on the rebound slide down here. But let's get the firing pin block out of the way and look at the rebound slide really quickly because it's not really the focus of this video, but it is actually the primary safety on the Smith & Wesson design. And the way it's working is that the hammer cannot move forward because right here, this lump of metal on the rebound slide is interfering with this lump of metal on the hammer. So the hammer can't be pushed forward. Now, if I cycle this, which you wouldn't normally want to do, but we've taken precautions. If I cycle this, it doesn't really want to anyway, because everything is sitting kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's giving me some trouble? It doesn't particularly like not having all of its parts in. Okay, I just had to get a little bit of help getting started. So if we cycle this, try to get this in frame well. If we cycle it, it falls through. We can see that as the trigger was pulled, the rebound slide moved back. And now these two surfaces don't interfere because this is further back than it had been previously. Now, if I release the trigger and kind of help everything out because we're running on weak springs here, you'll see that when it comes back forward under spring pressure, it comes back forward under the spring pressure, it pushes, let's do it again, it pushes against the hammer there. It moves it back into the standoff position. And the transfer bar is a redundancy. It isn't actually ever blocking the hammer during normal operation. So it's here and we have it pushed up to where it is in the way 
of the hammer, just like that. But you can see it's loose in here. It isn't actually stopping the hammer. And that's because of the rebound slide and the way it's functioning. So what happens is, as you pull the trigger back, and if this was riding in its proper slot in, in the uh, side plate, it would be pulled down like so. And it bounced out because it's not being held. But it comes down and is pulled out of the way so the hammer can go all the way forward and the firing pin is able to protrude. Reset it again. And it kind of almost worked that time where the uh, transfer bar, or not transfer bar, firing pin block. I'm going to say it wrong three times. The hammer block has come up back to block the hammer. So, kind of hard to demonstrate that just because of the concerns with damaging the revolver, having to use lighter springs, and the nature of that side plate being necessary to show real proper function of the hammer block. Now, if we come over here to the Colt, we can take a look at it. I've also got some parts removed here, mainly the cylinder stud. Well, obviously the cylinder, the cylinder stud, the side plate are off. This one, and I'm not sure if this is the case on the old pythons, but on this new python, it doesn't actually depend on the side plate to reinforce those studs. So kind of neat there, we can actually demonstrate this one under full power, just making sure that I don't let the hand walk. So let's take a look at this. If you look, what our transfer bar is, is this piece of metal right here. Right there is the transfer bar. And it is affixed to the trigger right here beneath the pivot for the hand. I think on Colt you might call it a paw, but I'm going to call it a hand. So what happens is as the revolver cocks, as this, the trigger is coming back, it moves up to where it gets into a position where it is now covering the frame mounted firing pin. So let's look at it from this direction. The hammer is sitting all the way forward against the frame. As the hammer is drawn back, you can briefly see the firing pin, this little black cylinder, exposed. And as we're cocking, the trigger is being moved to the rear. And it comes up to cover the firing pin. So that when the trigger is pulled, this gap that exists here in the hammer is filled. And it's able to have a good solid strike. Because if that isn't there, the hammer maxes out on this protruding portion of it against the frame and the firing pin isn't struck. But with the transfer bar being moved up by the rear of the trigger here as it's pulled, that causes that gap to be filled and the chain to be complete. I've got a little drawing here to depict that a little bit, just because you can't really see it fully because of the, uh, the frame being in the way. But you basically have the frame here, 
here. You have the firing pin sitting in the frame, sticking back slightly. You have the hammer with a protrusion on the top of it so that it can't come all the way forward and contact the firing pin. All that's happening, as you're pulling the trigger back, you have the transfer bar come up in front of the firing pin to where it's filling in this gap and the hammer can then transfer energy through the transfer bar into the firing pin. It's as simple as that. Pretty good mechanism. So that pretty well covers it. I mean, obviously there are other differences in how these revolvers work, but I just wanted to kind of talk about how they've approached safety in two different ways where you have kind of a, a redundancy in the Smith & Wesson but where if this breaks, it isn't going to fail in a non-firing condition, it fails in a firing condition, but it is a redundancy. You, you do have the, the rebound slide. Whereas the Colt, it is in a fail non-firing state where if this breaks, it makes sure the revolver isn't going to fire in an unsafe condition, even though that also prevents it from firing in a normal trigger pulled condition. So it's just two different ways of looking at it and two different ways of approaching the problem. Both work well in practice. Uh, they're both fantastic mechanisms, both fantastic revolvers made by fantastic companies that have done uh, some really good things over the I guess, centuries now in revolver development and refining uh, safe and smooth and effective operating mechanisms. So. That's about all I have for you. If you watched all the way to the end, I appreciate it because I know this was a little bit long and kind of technical. Uh, hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment if you have any preferences on what you think is a better system or what you like, and check back for the next video. Thanks, folks.